From Satanist to Saint, the life of Bartolo Longo. Bartolo Longo, Apostle of the Rosary, Dominican Churchery, and founder of the Marian city of New Pompeii, was born in a southern Italian city called La Siano on February the 10th, 1841, to Dr. Bartolo Meo Longo and Antonia Luparelli. His parents were well-to-do, which enabled him to receive a fine education. As they were devout Catholics, most especially his mother, he and his siblings grew up with a deep love for Mary. The rosary was implanted in Bartolo's heart at a young age, as his family prayed the rosary together every evening, meditating on the life of Jesus and Mary. From his earliest years, one could see the characteristics which would catapult him into a greatness. He was charismatic, he excelled in everything he endeavored. He fared well in his studies, exposed to music at an early age. He loved to play the piano and the flute, even becoming the conductor of the school band. But his parents' influence would not be always with him. The time came when he would enter the Naples University, once made illustrious by two doctors of the church, St. Thomas Aquinas and St. Alphonsus. As is true in many universities down through the ages, Bartolo Longo was bombarded by deadly, liberal, atheistic, anti-Christian, heretical courses, especially in a philosophy class given by a fallen away priest. Subsequently, Bartolo fell into the trap and began his sad walk away from the Catholic Church. He was so completely taken in by his professor and all the hate he was spewing against the Catholic faith. Bartolo Longo, too, began to rant and rave against the church. The ex-priest took away his anchor of faith, and in this void he found another. Only this one would help him to sink into the mire of decadence. Falling in with students who were deeply involved with the occult, he, too, began to delve into mysticism with his fellow cultists attending every seance he could. Bartolo Longo got so involved, not being a half-measured kind of person, he was ordained a priest in a satanic cult. As his cult attacked the church, her priests, bishops, and religious, as well as the holy rites of the church, he too piped in. With all the charisma and training he had received preparing him for a career in law, he was able to convince others to stray away from Jesus and Holy Mother Church, the Catholic Church. God waited patiently, but not allowing him to continue harming his soul and the souls of others due to the unceasing prayers of his mother. God allowed Bartolo Longo to fast so severely, seeking for the ultimate truth, he called it, he dangerously jeopardized his health. These extreme fasts and austerities were imposed by his cultic regimen. Not only his physical health was in grave danger, but his mental as well. He soon found himself sinking further and further into a deep depression. His exposure to the horrible rituals and practices he witnessed in the cult so devastated him he had suffered a mental breakdown. But these dark times would only last for a short period, as Jesus could not resist Bartolo's mother's pleas. Still away from Mother Church, he was close to despair when he heard a voice resembling his deceased father calling to him, Return to God! return to God. The day finally came in Naples when in 1864 Bartolo finally concluded his education, receiving a diploma to practice law, which he did in Naples until 1871. All the rosary said, all the supplications by his mother, Our Lady finally stepped in and sent him to Professor Vincente Pepe, a good friend who taught near Naples. When Bartolo shared his experiences in the rituals of the satanic cult, the professor became so repulsed and enraged, his outburst stunned Bartolo. Desperately crying out for help, Bartolo admitted he was deeply troubled. Professor Vincente introduced Bartolo to a Dominican priest, well-versed in the theology and philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas. His name was Father Alberto Radente. By the grace of God and the intercession of Mother Mary, this dear priest would serve as a confessor and a spiritual director, as well as friend to Bartolo. Father Redente helped him to relinquish all ties with the satanic cult once and for all. He prepared him to receive the sacraments by giving Bartolo an extensive course in the faith. Jesus said, 
This kind can be cast out in no way except by prayer and fasting, and Father Redente took that as seriously as one could. God sent Bartolo a prayer warrior in Father Redente. He prayed and fasted for his young spiritual son. One has to wonder if he knew how great would be the task this young man would undertake for the glory and honor of Jesus and Mary and succeed. Father taught him the history of the Dominican order, of course founded by St. Dominic, and confirmed by Pope Honorius III in 1216. He shared what it meant to be a member of the Dominican order. He quoted Pope Honorius, who declared the Dominicans would be champions of the faith and true light of the world. On March 25, 1871, Bartolo Longo was professed a secular third order Dominican by Father Redente, at which time he was given the name Brother Rosary, because of his great love for the Rosary and Mother Mary. Grieving over the harm he had done as part of the satanic cult, Bartolo went about trying to repair the horrific damage to the souls of those he had encountered and convinced to lead that diabolical life. Bartolo Longo even visited a seance and raised a medal of the Mother Mary, cried out, I renounce spiritism because it is nothing but a maze of error and falsehood. Remembering where he was first exposed to this dangerous, deadly thinking, he went to the universities. He joined the young people at parties and mingled with them in cafes, showing how he had been duped into leaving all that was dear to him, Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church. As brilliantly as he had led unsuspected students away from the truth, he now led them back home to Jesus in the Catholic Church. They were enthralled by his words and testimony, and many conversions came about, but he wasn't satisfied. He wanted to do more, to touch more souls for Jesus and Mary. Father Redente advised him, if you are looking for salvation, propagate the rosary. It is the promise of Mary, he who propagates the rosary shall be saved. In 1872, he went to the valley of Pompeii near Mount Vesuvius to settle legal problems related to the properties of the Countess Mariana de Fusco. There he was appalled at the religious ignorance and laxity of the people and prayed to Our Lady for her intervention. Bartolo Longo was once quoted, with boldness of desperation, I lifted my face and hands to the heavenly virgin and cried, if it be true that you promise St. Dominic that the whoever spreads the rosary will be saved, I will indeed be saved because I will not leave Pompeii until I have spread your rosary. Bartolo quickly became involved in charitable apostolates with several priests and also worked with the wealthy countess Mariana de Fusco. Because Bartolo and Mariana worked together so much, gossip developed that they were romantically involved. To prevent their good work from being tainted by this talk, the two married in April of 1885, but lived together celibately in keeping with private vows they both took previously before the marriage. The young lawyer's first attempt to teach the mysteries of the rosary failed, as we should never forget the great works of God often begin with failure. Bartolo persuaded people of the area to help him clean out a dilapidated church that was abandoned. Then he invited the people to join him one evening to pray the rosary. Only a few curious children came. Despite the fact that the intrepid disciple of the rosary visited every hut and farmhouse to distribute rosaries, medals, and encouragement, his apostle had met with meager success. The people loved and respected Bartolo, but they neither understood nor cared to learn about the rosary. Bartolo then sponsored a festival on the Feast of the Holy Rosary in 1873. He distributed pictures of Our Lady and hundreds of rosaries in preparation of the feast. His first effort failed. It rained, and the preacher spoke in classical Italian instead of the local dialect which the people understood. He tried the next year. He wasn't much more successful, but he had taught some of the people to pray the rosary. The third year, he invited the Redemptionist Fathers to hold a two-week mission. In preparation, he fully restored the little church. When the bishop preached a 10-day rosary mission, the entire village joined the rosary confraternity. It was, in fact, the bishop who envisioned a large church and pilgrimage place in the future. The prelate urged the building of a rosary chapel and authorized a public drive for funds. One penny a month was asked of the faithful, 
Money poured in from all sides. Bartolo began the project by first hunting for a picture of Our Lady of the Rosary. The only one he could afford was an imitation of an oil painting on paper, but church law required sacred images to be painted in oils on canvas or wood. He was told about a painting of Our Lady of the Rosary being kept in a convent that had been purchased for a small price at a junk shop. The picture was donated by a nun of that convent and foretold Bartolo, this picture will work miracles. Bartolo described the picture himself. Not only was it worm-eaten, but the face of the Madonna was that of a coarse, rough countrywoman. A piece of canvas was missing just above her head. Her mantle was cracked. Nothing need be said of the hideousness of the other figures. Saint Dominic looked like a street idiot. To Our Lady's left was a Saint Rose. This I had changed later into a Saint Catherine Siena. I hesitated whether to refuse the gift or to accept. I took it. The image was too large to carry from Naples to Pompeii, but Bartolo finally found someone who would take it to the chapel for him. When it arrived, it was lying on a wagon of manure. An attempt was made by an amateur to restore it. The artist refurbished the unsightly canvas and ornamented it with diamonds donated by the faithful, and it was placed in the church on February 13, 1876, which was the foundation day for the confraternity of the Holy Rosary at that chapel. When it was exposed for veneration, miracles started taking place and pilgrimages began. The heart of the shrine was and still remains the miraculous picture of the Queen of the Rosary with Saint Dominic and St. Catherine of Siena kneeling beside her throne. It should be noted that in 1880, the famous Italian painter Federico Madalarelli offered it to restore the image of Pompeii and did so. It was again finally restored by Vatican artists in 1965. In 1876, the bishop laid the cornerstone of the chapel and volunteers carried rocks of volcanic lava on the site. As the edifice rose, miraculous cures were reported and influential benefactors came to visit. Among these were Queen Margarita of Italy, Lady Herbert of England, the royal family of Spain, cardinals and papal representatives. The countess appealed to rich friends in Naples and Bartolo undertook a fundraising tour of Italy. Reports about the miraculous shrine circulated in Europe and in the Americas. Among the first prodigies recorded were the cure of Bartolo's dying mother, the restoration to perfect health of a paralyzed Jesuit priest, and a miraculous cure which was accepted by the Holy See for the canonization of St. Margaret Mary Aliquie. The most famous of miracles of Our Lady of Pompeii was that of the Fortuna Agrelli. For 13 months, Fortuna Agrelli had endured dreadful sufferings and torturous cramps. The most celebrated physicians had given up on her condition. And on February 16, 1884, the afflicted girl and her relatives commenced a novena of rosaries after a visit to the shrine. 